This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and discord servers, on screen shout outs and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. I have not been a regular viewer of ESPN in a very long time. Um, you know, when Grantland came out and the podcast came out and you had like the Jalen Rose report, which then turned into Jalen Jacoby, that's where I ended up gravitating to. Um, so I haven't watched these sports talk hot, t hot take shows that they have. Um, but if I could offer one piece of advice to ESPN that would make their brand um, their brand goodwill go up and like just their product more interesting in my opinion, it would be that they have to stop relying on hiring former coaches, former general managers, and former players to fill out their roster. Now, not saying that former players aren't good at media or anything like that, or former coaches or former GMs. Um, not not saying that at all. There are plenty of examples of guys who have done it and done it well. But when you become overly reliant on that, and that's like the main thing that matters, you get a bunch of people who have expertise in a field, but aren't really asked to use that expertise because the job at ESPN is sports entertainment. It's some sports talk with entertainment value emphasized, right? And that doesn't mean that it's not of any value. There are ways that you could do sports entertainment and also be informative while you do it. There, there's a lot of different approaches. I'm not condemning one or saying that that's a problem. I'm just saying the issue with hiring these former players, former coaches, former GMs is that they do have a ton of expertise. But ESPN is not the type of place where you can showcase that expert expertise because that's not the job. The job is to be entertaining. And that brings me to Mike Tannenbaum, who had a take here that concerns the Cleveland Browns that we have to talk about because it was a, a rather silly take here and this is silly season so you know it's just what it is but I don't think or agree with the line of thought that oh because Dan Orlovsky was a bad player or not a great NFL player he has nothing of value to bring or because Mike Tannenbaum was a bad GM he has nothing of value to bring or because Eric Mangini was a bad head coach that he has nothing of value to bring these guys do have experience they do have insight on things that the average viewer would not have insight on and they do have value but how they are used ignores all of that value, right? Mike Tannenbaum can tell you a million different things about how deals get done and how uh, relationships get built and these things and that and how things leak to the media. And he would be very interesting to listen to if he were talking about things that had to, to do directly with his ex expertise um, as a general manager. But when he's trying to be a sports talk host, no offense to Mike Tannenbaum. No offense to Eric Mangini. He stinks. They both stink. They're not interesting. They don't really say anything that interesting. They don't really hold your attention. When was the last time? Like, this is the first time we're talking about a Mike Tannenbaum tape. He's been on there for, like, five years. He survived, like, a million different layoffs. Good for him. Um, but, like, I've never, like, been excited for Mike Tannenbaum to be on my screen. And that's not Mike Tannenbaum's fault. It's how they use him. And that's why I think that they, that's my first point. My, before I even critique about the video that we're about to see, my first point is ESPN's really got to hire less former players. They really got to hire less former coaches. Uh, or they got to stop hiring people just because of that experience. Because this is a different job. 
People need to be entertaining if they're going to be doing what ESPN does. Because when you can't be entertaining organically talking about sports because you're not that charismatic of an individual naturally, you end up resorting to just saying anything in order to stay entertaining. And this is just doing such damage to the discourse, man. Like, such damage to the discourse. Um, I'm already exhausted with off-season NFL uh, takes, and we're barely in here. So, you know what? Without further ado, let's listen to the take here. And there, this is a two-parter. I'm trading Deshaun Watson and a second-round pick to the New York Giants for Daniel Jones. And hear me out. What's if you're the, the Cleveland Browns, day? You have Dorian Thompson Robinson, you have Joe Flacco, and now a 27 year old Daniel Jones who has one year left of guaranteed money for $36 million and an enormous amount of flexibility moving forward. And if you're the Giants, you're getting Deshaun Watson, who's Are you? 29, Are you? who's making $46 million a year for the next three years and a second round pick. And to me, you need a front line difference making quarterback. Because, Bart, right now, if you're the Giants, how in the world do you win the NFC when you have to beat San Francisco, Green Bay, Dallas, Philly, and Detroit? With Daniel and I, Jones, right. Yeah, with Daniel Jones. So, to me. Okay, so first off, let's talk about the obvious here. He is suggesting that the Giants are going to upgrade at quarterback and get a second-round pick. Because it's clear to me the way he talks. He considers Deshaun Watson as a significant upgrade to Daniel Jones. So. If that's the case, and also let's keep in mind that the money is very similar between these two, Deshaun Watson and Daniel Jones. How does this trade make sense for Cleveland? And I know a lot of you guys are asking this question too. Why are the Giants in win now mode, but the Browns who went 11 and 6 aren't? Let's let let's let's go ahead and let's go ahead and look at his response to that question being brought up by Aaron Goldhammer. Why is Watson more valuable to the Giants than he would be to the Browns? Because they got to win. They got to win right now, and they're not going to get to where they want to go with Daniel Jones. But do, we we've got to win, though, Mike. Like do, we've been waiting for a Super Bowl here since nineteen since the Super Bowl was invented. You are winning. You won eleven games. That's really really hard to do, and you did it without Deshaun Watson. So now. How can we maximize what he could bring back to us? And that's why, to me, it's an opportunity. It gets more complicated because of you know what's happened and the money. But really, like if you're Cleveland, you have created a situation now where Deshaun Watson, if you could turn him into T. Higgins, Chris Jones, you're really improving your football team. And because of what you've been <sighs> able to do at the quarterback position, it gives you great flexibility. Yeah. Okay. All right. See, this is what I mean. All right. So this is what I mean. Mike Tannenbaum is a former general manager. He has tremendous insight on this. But Mike Tannenbaum's job isn't to tell you about the ins and outs of being a general manager. It's his job to do takes. Right? Hot takes, whatever. They want entertainment on screen. So now you have a former general manager of an NFL team acting as if the Browns can simply trade Deshaun Watson and poof, all that money goes away. Ugh. And... You have a former general manager acting as if there aren't other ways to bring down his cap hit if that were significant. Let's not even factor in the fact that Deshaun was 4-1 when he was out there. Um, you know, like I get it, mixed bag on Deshaun, you're not sold on him, but he is. Like, that's the confusing thing about this take is that on one end, for you to buy the like, you have to believe two things simultaneously, which 
can happen, but he he has to communicate this point clearly. Basically, for his trade to happen, the Browns have to think that Deshaun Watson is completely done. Like, he is not ever going to stay healthy, and even if he's healthy, he's not going to be close to what they need at quarterback, and you need the Giants to believe the exact opposite. So you need the team that's trading him to be low on him and the team that's trading for him to be high on him. High enough to, because this is a trade now, right? If you trade Deshaun Watson, I believe, and let me go to over the cap to check this, but if you trade him, it's not just that you have to take the cap hit into consideration that he gets for his base salary. You also have to eat dead money if you're the Brown. So it's not like you just trade Deshaun Watson and that money disappears. Like you're going to have to eat a portion of that money regardless because he's already had bonuses and um, things that have clocked in for him for this season when you restructured his contract last year. Again, you don't restructure somebody you plan to trade. It's just not how it works. Um, But yeah, if you trade Deshaun Watson, the Browns would have $62.9 million. $62.9 million. $62.9 million in dead cap. And they would save a whopping $1 million. And then they would be smacked on top of that with Daniel Jones's contract. Now, let me go look at Daniel Jones's contract real quick, right? Because maybe I'm tripping on this. But I don't believe Daniel Jones's contract is one that you can just cut out of because if that were the case, they would have tried to do it. No, there's $69 million of dead money there. So not only are both teams not saving any money, not only are both teams becoming much less flexible on this, um, it, 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 this makes no sense. This trade fundamentally, functionally makes no sense. And I refuse to believe that Mike Tannenbaum actually thought about this actually sat this through and thought it was a good deal in good faith. I cannot believe that. That just does not strike me as genuine. This man knows how the cap works. This man knows how restructures work. This man knows how trades work. This man knows the figures. He looked at the thing. I would have to imagine that the general manager inside of him is genuinely that curious that he would look at this trade and say to himself, does this make sense? And he knows it doesn't make sense, but What this trade does do is get them shared on Twitter. And this is what I mean back to my original point. If you had people on air who can be entertaining, they don't have to say this dumb shit on air to get attention. They don't. And if if that should be the priority for ESPN, the reason that, ESPN's reputation has gone downhill, in my opinion, is because they've gotten very formulaic and very lazy. They had some successes and they've tried to emulate those successes in everything that they do without really doing the work to analyze why those shows were successes. Say what you want about Skip Bayless. Say what you want about Stephen A. Smith. They were good at what they do because they were entertaining. Now, was some of the stuff that Skip Bayless said kind of crazy at times? Sure. But Skip always had, on some level, reasoning for what he believed. Whether that reasoning be a bit flawed, a bit cherry-picked, it is what it is. He could back it up. He didn't just go out there and outright say stuff he didn't believe in. And this is a trade proposal that I just cannot believe Mike Tannenbaum believes in because it doesn't make sense for the Giants or the Browns. It doesn't really save anybody any money if both the Giants and the Browns do this. Like, if anything, it, it saves the, the it saves it doesn't save the money because they're on the hook for what? 
a cap number of $47 million to Daniel Jones, which, by the way, worst contract ever given because we all knew that was a mistake when they gave it. But they're on the hook for $47 million for Daniel Jones. Um, and he's not the kind of player with the type of resume that you would feel any confidence about restructuring that deal, even though they might do it, right? So if you trade Daniel Jones, you save $13 million on the cap. Woo! But if you trade for Deshaun Watson... You lose all of that money plus. So nobody saves money. The Browns would lose. They would be have less cap space and have to restructure Daniel Jones. And I'm sorry, if I got to restructure Daniel Jones or Deshaun Watson, I would 1,000 times rather restructure Deshaun Watson. Now, this goes into what I like to call the rewriting of the 2023 season, right? Because Joe Flacco played well at the end of that season and the narrative got changed to Joe Flacco saved the Browns season. The Browns were a winning football team before Joe Flacco showed up. They were a winning football team after he showed up. They won with quarterbacks before Joe Flacco stepped up in there. They won with quarterbacks. They win with quarterbacks after he leaves. This wasn't a situation where the Browns were under 500. The Browns were a really good team. When they signed Joe Flacco, it was because Deshaun Watson went out for injury. When Deshaun Watson went out for injury, they had just beaten the one seed in the AFC on the road. This narrative that they were a bad team with Deshaun Watson or an underwhelming team with Deshaun Watson is simply not true. They beat two AFC North teams with them, and they blew out what the Tennessee Titans and the Arizona Cardinals. Blowouts, which the Browns struggled to replicate replicate throughout the year, right? Like, they didn't really blow anybody out except for what maybe the New York Jets and I think that second Houston game, right? They didn't blow anybody out until Joe Flacco got there. So it took Joe Flacco playing the best football he's played in like 10 years in order to get the same result that you were getting from an underperforming Deshaun Watson. It's going to be a long off season, man. I got no, like, I usually try to come with a bigger overall point with these videos and try to, like, say, my only point is, man, I think sports media is like this because <laughs> we're hiring people who are qualified to talk about football, to talk about it in the least interesting way possible. And that leads to a very qualified football talker in Mike Tedderbaugh suggesting a trade that he know damn well is stupid for so many reasons. He knows this trade proposal. I ain't even going to talk about the fact that he was like, yeah, you got to throw in a second round pick so we can have the pleasure of taking Daniel Jones's contract. That's so stupid. Like, I know what you're saying. You got to get the second round pick up. Like, why would you trade the second round pick and then take a bad contract? Like, if the whole purpose, if you're willing, you're so willing to get off of Deshaun Watson that you are willing to trade a second round pick to get rid of his contract, why would you then trade for a contract that's ultimately going to be on the hook for more money than Deshaun Watson will be? Because remember, you're going to restructure him down to like $33 million. That's going to be his cap hit this year. If you trade it for Daniel Jones, your cap hit would definitely be $47 million because you're not restructuring Daniel Jones. So what, what, what is the purpose? What is the purpose? What is the purpose? Oh, you could get off Daniel Jones' contract in a couple of years. You could do the same thing with Deshaun Watson. It's, yeah, man, maybe I'm not in a great mood, but this was, this was a take. This one, this one broke me. <laughs> this one broke me, man. <laughs> this one was bad. Y'all have a great day. Have you better night. Peace.